uh, First Principles class. This is really the first step in, the, uh, in our journey discipleship program. And the reason why we called it First Principles is this class is taken uh, out of the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Okay, there's um, seven subjects that are mentioned there, and um, very important subjects. And uh, if you backed up in the uh, chapter 5, it would say that it actually uses the word first principles, and it calls it the milk of the word, not the meat of the word. So what you're going to get this morning is a whole bunch of uh, milk of the word, okay? These are basic steps in uh, doctrines that we believe everyone should be, you know, really grounded in. And um, you say, well, why do we have a class like this? Well, this church is growing so quickly, and uh, we get people from many different backgrounds, and Pastor Jerry covets unity, Okay, because when we see unity in the Bible, we see the power of God, the Spirit of God doing things. So he wants to maintain unity. And so uh, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures that are not in your handout. Okay, and so when I do, just write them down and you can look them up when you, when you get home. But 1 Corinthians 1.10 says that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together. That's what we're trying to do in this class. We realize you have different belief systems coming from different churches. And this is a basic uh, doctrinal class of what we believe here at Grace. And uh, as, it, uh, as I said before, it's taken out of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We believe it's the starting point for all church doc New Testament church doctrine. Okay, these are things that you need to know. And if you're thoroughly grounded in these, you'll not, you know, as you go along in your, your spiritual walk, you'll not get moved away from them. Okay, and again, we want everybody believing and speaking the same thing so we can maintain unity in the class. There's seven subjects, as I said, covered here in Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, we've added five more subjects to that to make it 12, because there's six classes, and you'll receive uh, teaching on, on two subjects in each class. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8.2, you can write that down. It says, if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet, as he ought to know. Nobody knows everything about this Bible. Okay, if they say that they do, they're just, you know, they're just not, not thinking right. Okay, but we don't know everything, but what we know and uh, believe in our hearts, you know, that's, that's what we teach. And we're trying to put that in you. Okay, write this verse down, Psalms 119, Psalm 119, verses 99 through 100. Psalm 119, verses 99 and 100, the psalmist says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. And then he says, why? For thy testimony, or the word, the Bible, uh, thy testimonies are my meditation. That means being a hearer of God's word. There's a principle throughout the Bible that you are to be a hearer and a doer, all right, of God's word. Then verse 100, it says, um, I understand more than the ancients, meaning the ancient teachers, okay? I understand more than the ancients. Why? He says, because I keep thy precepts. In other words, I'm a, do a doer of the word, all right? And like I say, that's a principle throughout the word of God. If you're just going to be a hearer of God's word, which happens in many churches, even in this one, people just come and hear the word but never become a doer of it. Well, the first of all, the Bible says that you're going to deceive your own self, okay? And that's not a good thing. It also says if you're a hearer only when the storms of life come again, you, you know, because your foundation is not right, it's going to get washed away, okay? And that's not a good thing here. So we want you to be a hearer and a doer of God's Word. Now, when everybody look up here at me, if you see me do this, that means I'm saying something very, very important, all right, or God is speaking, and I want you to get it, all right? Also, if there's any questions, please write it down. Uh, email it to me or, or see me maybe at lunch or something like that. You may hear something that is unfamiliar or maybe you just don't believe. Well, if that's the case, come and talk to me about it. All right, call me or, you know, uh, so we can sit down and talk about it. Okay, you should have in your possession uh, the binder, the first uh, uh, journey binder with the first principles class in there. You should have a timeline sheet and a, a test and a um, ministry interest form. Okay, and if you don't have those, you can download those from our website. Okay, let's get into our class here. Okay, first, page number one. Okay, salvation, all right, repentance from dead works and a faith towards God. That is listed there in Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through 6. Okay, Romans 3.23, all right, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every, everyone, every person that comes in this earth, all right, they're all going to sin and they're all going to come short of the presence of God. A, 
sin separates us from the presence of God. Now, if you're an unbeliever, and that means if you've rejected the salvation that God has offered to us through Christ, if you've rejected that, okay, you are going to go into a place called hell when you die. That's not a good thing, all right? We don't want that. But that's what you have to look forward to if you reject Christ. All right, now, with a believer who sins, what's going to happen is you're going to hurt your fellowship with God. How many are married in this room? Okay. All right. How many have had an argument with your spouse? Okay. I may know that things cool off a little bit during that time, right? But you're still married, right? <laughs> okay. Well, that's the same way I want you to understand the covenant that you have with God. You are going to make some mistakes. And when you do, that's going to interrupt or cause problems in your fellowship with God. Doesn't mean you're unsaved. Doesn't mean you're lost and going to hell or anything like that. But you hurt your fellowship with God. Just as in a marriage. You know, when husband and wife argue, you know, and they don't talk to each other for a few hours. Don't let it go longer than that. Amen. All right. Okay. It hinders the relationship you have, you're the fellowship, but you're still husband and wife, okay? So when you sin as a believer, okay, don't, don't worry about that you've lost your salvation. I'm going to cover that very thoroughly in the fourth class. You know, can a person lose their salvation? How many have ever heard of that since you've been in a church? Well, I'm going to cover that as thoroughly, thoroughly as I can in class number four, okay? B, all means everyone because we have all sinned. Now, uh, I want you to turn to page number four in your class outline. Okay, we believe um, that a person, uh, when is conceived in the womb, okay, now that's not the first time that God has anything to do with you. The Bible says he knew you before the foundations of the earth were laid. He knows when you're coming and he knows when you're going. Amen. All right, this is a sheet here on page number eight. Uh, we believe that a person, when they come into the womb, that there's a work of God that's done. Okay, that takes place. And, and I give you uh, 10, and I'm going to add another scripture to that. 10 scriptures that show that God forms the spirit, okay, on the inside of you. Now, also, you have the sheet that you picked up, the timeline sheet, okay. Um, I want you to look on there for, for uh, a minute. And uh, in the bottom left corner, I got two examples of spirit, soul, and body. That's what you are. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a physical body. Okay, now, two of those are corrupt, okay? All right, the Bible talks about we inherited a sin nature from Adam. All right, now that's really the next verse. Let's go ahead and read that. Romans 5, 12, it says, Wherefore is by one man, referring to Adam, sin entered into the world, and death, spiritual and physical death, all right, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. A, we inherited a sin nature. I call that an inner controlling force from Adam. All right, B, Adam's disobedience or sin brought death to all of us. You're going to have to write fast in this class. If you miss any answers, you know, I'll have them after the class, okay? All right, so we come into this world, okay, through our mother's womb, okay, conceived in our mother's womb. And actually, uh, uh, we believe that your spirit, God puts that spirit on the inside of you at that point of conception. And that spirit is alive unto God. That's why I give you these 10 scriptures here on uh, page number uh, 4. Let's just look at a couple of them. Zechariah 12.1. Look at the part that I have underlined. It says that God, he formeth the spirit of man within him. I right, drop down to Ecclesiastes 12.7. It says, uh, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Well, when did God give it? He had to give it in the womb. You know, um, if you go back and read the story of creation, how many know that the Bible says that um, uh, Adam, he was just a hundred pounds of clay. Anybody remember that song? Gene McDaniel, a long time ago. All right. He was just a, a pile of dust. And uh, he didn't have no movement, no life or anything until God breathed into him the breath of life. And then it says, and then he became a living soul. Well, that's what has to take place in the womb. God has to breathe into that womb a spirit. Okay, and then you start to grow and develop in your mother's womb. And that spirit is alive unto God. All right. It's alive unto God, and as you go through life, and as we get older, and, you know, our thinking is developed, we choose to follow sin. We make a conscious decision to go after the things of darkness. We now die spiritually, and that spirit that was alive unto God now becomes dark. 
okay, and is separated from God. And now somebody has to come along and share words of salvation with you. And when you receive those words and you receive Jesus, you now become uh, back alive unto God or born again. It's really very simple, okay? But read those verses. All right, let's look at another one, Romans um, or no, Isaiah 42, uh, verse 5 there at the end. It says that God gives spirit to them that walk therein. Okay, and another one in Acts, at the bottom there, Acts 17, 25. It says, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. All right, seeing he giveth to all. Means all means every person that comes into this world. He gives, he gives what? Life, that's, that word life there is the Greek word zoe, and it means the life of God. Okay, so he gives to all life and breath and all things. So we want you to understand that you are born alive unto God in your mother's womb. All right, but you're a three-part being. Two parts of you, all right, your soul and your body are corrupt. Your body, okay, if, you know, from the time, you know, you come through the, you know, uh, you're born, your body is corrupt. It's going to want to do silly things. It's going to want to sit around, watch TV all day, eat chocolates, and dr drink uh, Pepsi Cola. Okay, it's going to it's going to hinder you for the rest of your life until you go to be with Jesus and you receive a new uh, body. We'll talk about that. Okay, but your body is corrupt. It wants to do stupid things. Now, as you go through life in your mental realm, your mind, your will, and your emotions, or your soul gets developed, it gets corrupt because that world out there that is a mean, ugly, cruel world. The devil is going to try and shape and form and mold your thinking. All right, and it's going to become corrupt. So those two parts eventually lead the spirit man off into darkness. Okay, all right, that's what, you know, you became. You became a sinner. How many became real good at it? You know, how many could raise everything, you know, when I say something like that? All right, you become real good at it. And you become darkened. Your spirit becomes darkened. And now has to be born again or made alive, okay, back unto God. That's simply what it means to be born again. Okay, all right. Uh, a there, we inherited a sin nature, as I said, an inner controlling force from Adam. B, Adam's disobedience or sin brought death to all of us. Okay, there's three types of death mentioned in the scripture. First one is spiritual death. That's the spirit and the soul when is separated from God. Now, the spiritual death is, uh, now that you're a believer, that doesn't pertain to you. You've been redeemed from that, okay? All right, but a person who is unsaved or has never, you know, received Christ into their lives, when they die, they are going to go into a place called hell. Okay, and they're going to be in there for quite a long time. And uh, eventually hell is going to be, uh, become, they're going to be resurrected from there, and then they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. We'll talk about that later on. All right, and then uh, number two, their physical death. And should the Lord Jesus tarry, we're all going to experience physical death. That's where the spirit and soul leave the body. All right, if you were to die right now, your spirit and soul would go into the presence of God. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The minute at the point of death, you're going to open your eyes and you're going to see Jesus standing there to receive you into heaven. Okay, you may see your family members that preceded you. He's going to take you to a mansion. King James says that's really not a good translation. It should be dwelling place. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's what Jesus wants for every human being who comes into this earth, that where Jesus is, he wants you with him. So at the point of death, you're going to see Jesus. He's going to take you to a dwelling place that he has prepared for you. How I many know that's going to be a pretty nice thing? You know, he's pretty good at preparing things, okay? So that's something that we have to look forward to. All right, and then the third, number three, is, is an, uh, an event, okay? It's uh, the second death. That's called the white throne judgment that's on your timeline sheet. Let's quickly look at this timeline sheet, and I'll take you through this. This is timeline covers all the way from Genesis 1, okay, the first uh, book in the Bible, to the book of Revelation, the last book. Okay, we have creation. We have approximately 2,000 years, and this man Abraham comes along, who God made a covenant with. Then we have another two, approximately 2,000 years to the first coming of, uh, of Jesus, who, as you all know, died on a cross for your sins and for the sin of the whole world. Now, the next event that's going to happen before his second coming, which is approximately 2,000 years from his first coming, is called the rapture of the church. That's where he's going to call for the church off the face of the earth. The Bible says that 
the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we which are alive and remain will follow them. Okay, and he's going to call us up into heaven, and we are going to go there and spend maybe seven years. Okay, now there's some different teachings on this when, you know, is the rapture going to happen before the seven year tribulation period? We don't take a position on that, my own personal position, that I believe it's going to be for that. He's going to call the church up off the face of the earth. Why? Because we've not been subject to wrath and in torment, and that's what's going to happen during that seven year period. All right, we're going to spend. You know, hopefully seven years up in heaven where we're going to experience the judgment seat of Christ. What does that mean? Well, you're going to stand before Jesus and you're going to give account, all right, of the things that you've done in your life. Things that he has told you to do. Okay, you're going to give an account of that. And if you did them right, you did them for the right motives, not to be seen of men, but you did them to honor God, and you're going to be judged for those things. Okay, some of your works are going to stand the test, some aren't. But the fact that you're in heaven means that you made it, right? So you're in a pretty good place. Okay, and for those works, you're going to receive crowns. You're going to receive positions. When we come back to earth, you're going to be over cities and nations, okay? You're going to rule, okay, if you were obedient to do what God has instructed you to do. Okay, all right, so we have the rapture where we're called off the face of the earth, and then at the second coming, that means we come back with Jesus. We're going to come back riding white horses, have white robes, and... Uh, uh, we are going to do business with the forces of the Antichrist at a battle called Armageddon. And uh, we're not going to have to fight. We're just going to make some noise with our horses. Amen? I mean, no, you don't go to a fight wearing a white robe. That doesn't make sense. Jesus, the Bible says, is going to consume them with the words of his mouth. Jesus is going to do all the fighting there. We're just going to, you know, stir up them horses a little bit and make some noise. Okay? Now, after that, Christ is going to rule here on the earth, and we will rule with him. You will receive areas of, that you're going to rule over. All right, you're going to have positions. And we're going to rule for what's called a thousand years. Okay, that's mentioned six times in Revelation chapter 20. All right, the millennial reign of Christ, which means the thousand years. We're going to rule and reign with him. At the end of that thousand years, Satan, who is bound in the bottomless pit during this time, okay, is going to be loose to tempt people and test them, and um, there's still going to be some, even though Jesus is walking the earth now, and us with them, that's going to be kind of unusual. We are going to come back. We have a glorified body, okay? And there's going to be people on the earth who are just regular bodies like you have right now. We're going to be able to walk through walls. You know, how many know when Jesus was, was uh, after he died and was resurrected, the Bible says he appeared unto the disciples in a room where the doors were shut. Well, how do you get there? You just walk right through the wall. You're going to be able to do that because you're going to have a glorified body. How many are going to look forward to that? That's going to be cool. All right. Okay. And so uh, at the end of this, like I said, there's, Satan will be loose to tempt people because there's still going to be some that are going to reject Jesus. There's going to be a final battle with Satan. He's going to be cast into the lake of fire. Okay. He's going to be cast into the lake of fire. And then there's going to be the white throne judgment. Okay, which is the second death, it's called. And that's when all unbelievers are going to be resurrected and go through a judgment, and then they are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And then what happens after that? Well, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven in Revelation chapter 21, and then we just rule and reign with a new heaven and a new earth for all eternity. Okay, all right, now, um, so anyway, look at those scriptures about, you know, being alive unto God in the womb, and... Um, now, some people don't believe that. Some churches don't teach that. They teach the, that you're mean, ugly, corrupt, and uh, because you've got that sin nature. And they emphasize the sin nature. And that's true. That sin nature does eventually take hold in your life, and you follow sin, and then you have to be born again. Okay? But now, they, a lot of them use this scripture here. Write this down, Psalm 51.5. Psalm 51.5, David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Oh, there we go. They say, you're born in sin, you're corrupt, you're evil, you can't know the things of God. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. You are alive unto God. All right? God doesn't put an evil spirit on the inside of you. He puts a spirit that is alive unto him. He, that's where you receive your gifts and talents and personalities. Okay? How many, how many got more than one child in this room? All right. I've got three children and they're all three different. OK, why? Because that's God. 
All right, he put that spirit on the inside of them. They all got gif different gifts and talents and abilities, okay? And if you have more than one child, you know what I'm talking about, okay? That's that spirit that's on the inside. Again, alive unto God, but as you go through life and choose to follow sin, you now become darkened and need to be made alive again or born again or born twice. Okay, it's very important that you understand that. I once was, uh, you know, I don't do this very often. I listen to a lot of, you know, Christian radio, and I heard a guy talking about this. And um, he was a Presbyterian minister. I believe he was Presbyterian. Presbyterians believe in the doctrine of election. We'll cover that in, in a little bit. But uh, that means God picks and chooses who's going to get saved and who, who goes to hell. And he says, and he quoted this scripture here, you know, oh, we're born in sin and all that, you know, and saying how ugly and corrupt you are. You can't know the things of God. I'll, I'll show you that's totally wrong. Okay. In, in another class. So I called in and I said, hey, you know, are, are we born dead, meaning born dead to the things of God, or do we become dead to the things of God? He's, oh, no, no, we're born dead. You know, and he quoted this scripture here. And I said, well, let me give you 10 scriptures that say that that's not true. Well, he got silent, you know, and he said, well, just give me one. I read Acts 17, 25 to him. And, he's, and then I read another one, Zechariah 12, 1. He says, well, maybe God does do a work in the womb and puts a spirit in there. He's, but that spirit has to be evil. And I said, wait a minute. Now you're saying God gives us an evil. This is a man on the radio. You know, I could give you his name, but I won't. Okay. But he teaches, you know, for several hours on the radio every day. He says, God puts an evil spirit on the inside of you. I said, wait a minute. Now you're telling us that God does something evil in the womb? Well, yeah, and then they shut me off. They clicked me off. All right. But people out there believe that stuff, that you're corrupt and evil and can't know the things of God. Uh, I'll show you that in a little bit. Okay. Anyway, all right, let's get back to our page number one, the fall of man. Very important that you understand this. Okay. Adam and Eve walked in the presence of God, fellowship with God, ate with God, worked with God. Bible says that um, God brought the animals unto Adam to see what he would name them. He's showing him how to take dominion in authority over the earth. Write these scriptures down. Psalm 115, verse 16. Psalm 115, verse 16. It says, The heaven are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. God created this earth for man. Okay? For man, for Adam and Eve to rule and walk in dominion over and control of. But the devil deceived them. All right. He says, hey, you know, God said, don't eat of that tree of knowledge of good and evil for in the day that you eat, you're going to die. So what is what does the devil do? He comes along in the form of a serpent and confuses Eve and gets her to eat of that fruit. He says, hey, when you eat of that tree, you know, it's a tree to make make one wise. When you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. OK. And so Eve fell for the deception that she would have the knowledge of God. All right. She was already made, and so Adam also made in the image of God. They look like God, okay? But the devil deceived them, said, you know, and they fell for the knowledge. Well, the knowledge that they received when they ate of that uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil was that sin nature that now came in to Adam and Eve and governed their lives and all mankind after that, okay? It's important that you understand that. They fellowship with God, had relationship with God. And that's what God still desires for all of us. He wants to have relationship with us. But he can only have relationship with his believers now, believers in, in the Lord Jesus. We'll see that later on. Okay, but they fell for it. And now, now what's the first thing they do? They run away from God when they hear him coming. They make, you know, uh, cloths to, or uh, leaves to cover themselves, all right? Because they knew they were naked. They didn't. They didn't know that before. Now they have that sin nature working on the inside of them. But now, what happened to the control and the dominion of the earth that was meant for Adam and Eve? Where did it go? Because right after that, one of the first things we see is Cain killing Abel. We see murder come in. Well, who, who set all that up? All right, that wasn't in the plan of God. Sickness and disease, you can't find that in the garden, all right, with Adam and Eve. None of those things. All right. We believe that it was the devil now who has control of the earth. OK. Adam yielded up to him. Well, let's look at this. The fall of man. Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. He told them to subdue it, have dominion, take control of it. OK, a Adam had delegated authority from God over all the earth. B, he had constant fellowship with God. 
Okay, God would come down in the cool of the day and talk with them. See, he had no knowledge of sin, sickness, poverty, or death. All he knew is that when he ate of that, he would die. Okay, um, we don't know all the knowledge that Adam had of that, but I believe it was very limited. D, he had no needs. God provided everything for him, just as he will provide everything for you. E, life for Adam was rich and full of good things. This Garden of Eden, all right, it said that out of it flowed a river that fed four different rivers that, that fed that whole area. Okay, it was a prosperous area. The Bible says there was gold there, and the, and the gold of that land was good. Okay, and Adam and Eve had control over all that, and they lost all that, okay, when they disobeyed God. F, Adam lost all this when he disobeyed God. Adam and Eve both lost it. All right, so now what happened to the control and dominion of the earth that Adam now has? Well, he lost it. He yielded up. He gave it up. Now the, he has to work, you know, the earth where it just naturally produced things before that. Okay, now let's see, uh, where did it go? Satan's ascendancy to become God of this earth. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And it says, this is a 40-day temptation of Jesus and the devil. Now, there's only three temptations listed here. How many know three temptations would not take 40 days? All right, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. I believe that Jesus went through that, f that he had to defeat all the forces of darkness here at this time in this 40 day battle that's going on. There's a scripture, it's in Mark. Um, where is it? Mark, Mark uh, write this down Mark 1, verse 13. It says that Jesus was there with the wild beasts. Now, what does that mean? I believe that's every demonic creature in the world. Jesus faced at this temptation. That's just my opinion now. Okay? Three temptations would not take 40 days. He defeated the devil because he's going to start his ministry and go out and continue to defeat the, the devil in all his demonic realm. All right. But, okay. All right. Luke 4 uh, verses 5 and 6. And the devil, taking him, Jesus, up into a high mountain, showed him what all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. That means all the earth that Adam had, had rule over, the earth as we know it. And the devil said unto him, all this power, that word their power means authority, he says, will I give thee and the glory of them, all right, the dominion and authority and everything, he says, for that which is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Well, Jesus didn't say, you're a liar, Satan. You don't have control and authority to do that. No, he didn't say that. That means he did have the authority. For this to be a legitimate temptation, the devil had to have control of the earth. And it's important that you understand it. Well, where did he get that from? He got that from Adam. They yielded up that control and authority that they had in the garden. And it went over to Satan. And now we see the devil ruling the earth. And the first thing we see coming in is murder. All right, the murder of Cain and Abel. And then we see all kinds of stuff come in, rape, hatred, incest, all kinds of stuff. Why? Because the devil is now in control of the earth. And so what did Jesus do? When he came, all right, when he came to earth as a man, when he took on the form of a man, all right, and defeated sin in, in hell and the grave at the cross, all right, he defeated the authority of the devil and he took that authority away from him. Revelation talks about that he went, you know, and, and took the keys, the keys of authority away from the devil and gave it to now this body that you are in, the body of Christ. He gave it to the church. So now we can walk back in authority, all right, over the devil. We have salvation. We're children of God. We're in covenant with God, all right? And we, and that authority has been given back to us. So we don't have to yield to the things of darkness anymore. We have authority over them. All right. It's, I underline there for that which is delivered unto me in uh, the Amplified. It means it says to surrender, to yield up or to turn over. All right. So Adam turned over, or yielded up his authority that he had to the devil. And the devil made good use of it and is still making good use of it. All right. Doing his evil stuff. OK. But the church has to learn that once we accept Christ, we now have authority over him. Second Corinthians 4, 4. It says, in, uh, in whom the God of this world, that's referring to the devil. That's originally what Adam was supposed to be, was an under God, okay, a little God over all this earth, okay? That went over to the devil, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There are approximately seven billion people on the face of this earth. Six billion, and let's say there's one billion Christians, 
Okay? That means six billion people on this earth, the devil has their minds blinded. All right? The devil's a pretty powerful individual. He's got a, a, a very skilled demonic realm that works for him. Think about it. Six billion people on the face of this earth. He has, he has control of their minds. All right? But think of this. Because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have authority over the one that has six billion minds captured. You have authority over him. Okay? All right. Write the scripture down. Well, let's, let's do the, the letter here. A. Satan gained the dominion. All right. And authority and control of the earth that Adam had been given to by God. All right. Adam, Adam yielded up to him. B. All sin, sickness, poverty, death, hatred, murder, war, etc. is the direct result of Satan's power and control of the earth. He finds men to do dumb things, start wars and do all kinds of stupid things. All right. He coerced you just like he coerced you as you were growing up. OK, you he brought people into your life to teach you how to sin and how to get involved in evil. OK. All right. John, write this down. John 12, 31. John 12, 31. Jesus called the devil the prince of this world. OK. Now turn the page. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, uh, verses 1 through 3. Very important. All right. So Paul writing to the church here, and he says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. What does that mean? As you were growing up, the course of this world, whatever they were doing, you got involved in it. If they were doing drugs, you got involved. If they were doing alcohol, you got involved. If they were doing, you know, uh, sexual things, you got involved with it. OK, that's what that means. All right. I did, had no idea I was going to steal cars when I was a teenager. A couple of my high school friends showed up one night and uh, knocked at my door and said, hey, let's go joyriding. I said, OK, we're, you know, who's got the car? Well, we're going to get one. Well, they took me over to a parking lot of a high school and, sh you know, showed me how to steal cars. <laughs> I had no idea I was going to do that, but they opened my mind to that. All right. Just like the devil brought people into your life to show you how to do dumb, evil things. OK. Nobody's exempt from that. All right. That's walking according to the course of the world. Whatever the world is doing at the time you were growing up, you got involved in. All right. Circle the words according to. All right. It's in there twice. That word according to in the Greek means throughout, beyond measure, mightily, uttermost. That's how much you were under his control. OK. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom... Uh, we all, every one of us, all had our conversation or lifestyle in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Okay, we all got involved in it. Okay, we all chose to follow after that stuff. Okay, and, uh, and we were, became real good at it. You were good sinners. <laughs> we all were. Okay, we were captivated by the devil. He was controlling us and manipulating us. All right. As we grew up, making sure that we got a good taste of evil. All right. How many know when you, you know, uh, you know, when you start drinking, how many know your body rejected that stuff? <laughs> you know, your body rejected it. You had to train it. Same with smoking. You know, first time you smoke, your lungs just willingly received that stuff. No, you probably started to cough and gag and all that. You had to train your body to do that. Okay. So you became good at those kind of things. All right. But the devil made sure that you were exposed to that. And the sad thing is that he's exposing things in kids' minds at younger and younger ages in the school systems in outside there on TV and all kinds of different ways that he tries to get into your mind. The Bible says there's so many kinds of voices in the world and they all have some significance. In other words, they're all trying to speak to you. And to get your mind to do goofy things. Your mind is where all your decisions are made. And if it's goofy up here, your actions are going to become goofy. All right? And then when you become a new believer in Christ, your spirit is alive unto God. You're alive back unto God, born again. But your mind is still goofy. Okay? All that dumb stuff up here. And your body, it's always going to be goofy. Okay, so why do you, that's why you come to church. That's why you take a class like this. All right, so you can learn, get new information up here so your actions change. Now, that may take some time. That may take the rest of your life. All right, till you get this thing totally renewed up here. You know, Pastor Jerry says the same thing. He's not perfect. Amen. Nobody in here is perfect. You're perfect in here, in your spirit, but you're not perfect up here, and certainly in your body, you're not perfect. 
Okay? But you got to get this developed up here. Get new knowledge in and see the things that Jesus has provided for you. And once you see the goodness of God operating in your life, Bible says, I believe it's Romans 5, 5 or Romans 5, 6. It says the goodness of God is, is what leads a person to repentance. When you see God's goodness, then you don't want to do that dumb stuff anymore. All right? You see how good God is. A, we have two forces trying to control us. Okay, B, our inner nature, which is our flesh and mind, all right, that's called the soul, your mind, your will, and emotions. Okay, flesh and mind. C, an external force, which is the devil or Satan and his kingdom of darkness. It works against you, all right, usually on a regular daily basis. D, this is why we sin so easily. We were under its control, okay? All right, now let's look at God's master plan of redemption and salvation. Okay, now you can, uh, you, can uh, you know, read that, you know, uh, there's no fill in the blanks there. You can read that when you get home, okay? But very simply, it talks about salvation. Jesus and God had a plan to send Jesus into the earth, all right, to go on a cross and die and make payment for sin and that we, you know, can become children of God. First Peter 3.18, it says, For Christ also has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. He was just, we were the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. A, through Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection is the only way, only way, okay, that we can be brought back to God. All right, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's only through Christ. And God can only fellowship Okay, with those that have accepted Christ into their lives. I'll show you that. He doesn't fellowship with Muslims or Buddhists or whatever. Does he love them? Yes. He sent Jesus to die for them. Amen. But he can't fellowship with them until they do something with his son. When you receive his son, the Holy Spirit comes in on the inside. Now God can fellowship with you. Doesn't mean he can't speak to unbelievers. He spoke to you as you were growing up. Just that we were not listening. I bet you if I asked everybody in here, you can remember having a, a, a moment with God as you were growing up. All right. Everybody would raise their hands. I know I did when I was growing up. Okay. I know that. But I rejected that just like you rejected it. God was trying to draw you into the kingdom. But we, you know, rejected that. We refused to listen. Romans 3.30, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision. All right. That's the Jew by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. It's always been by faith that you are right with God. Okay? Through faith or by faith. The Jews had no special covenant with God where they all get saved just because they were God's chosen people. They all have to receive Jesus into their lives. A, both Jew and Gentile are justified, which means right standing with God, made righteous or saved. All those mean the same thing. By faith. John 1.12 it says, but to as many as received him, Jesus. Now, this is referring to the Jews, okay? But to as many as received him, to them gave he power authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. There must be a receiving, all right, of the Lord Jesus Christ into your life. If you backed up into the previous verse, it said he came to his own, but his own received him not, referring to the Jew. The Jew rejected Jesus. He came to them first. There's a pecking order. God's got a pecking order. Okay, Jew first and then Gentile. He came to the Jews first and they rejected him. They helped put Jesus on the cross. Okay, they rejected him. All right, A, when we receive Christ, we now become sons of God. We are adopted into the family of God. How does that happen? This next verse, Romans 10, 9 and 10. This is how salvation comes to an individual. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He says, for with the heart man believes. It's got to come from your heart, not your head. Okay? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. A, three things are necessary necessary for our salvation or having a relationship with the Father, the Lord Jesus. All right. Faith from our heart and confession with our mouth. First one is the Lord Jesus and then faith from our heart and then confession of that faith out of our mouth. B, we now enter into a covenant with God and become part of the family of God. That verse is utterly critical in the New Testament that you know that. 
A person has to believe in their heart, not from their head. Most of us growing up, you might have went to Sunday school. I did. My parents at least had enough sense to take me to church almost every Sunday. Me and my two brothers, they would drop us off and they would go do their shopping and all that and then come back and pick us up. Now, I, that's not the best way. How many know that? But at least I got some word of God on the inside of me. I remember when I was very young, 11 or 12 at Christmas time, asking my mom to get me a Bible for Christmas. I, had the only read, I didn't want to read it. I just wanted to carry it like some of the adults that I saw going to church. Okay? But I knew that Jesus had died on a cross. You know, I went through Sunday school. I went through catechism and all that. But was I saved? No, I was not. That didn't come from, you know, when I was in my early 30s. Okay, when I accepted Christ, I grew up in a Lutheran church. Okay, did not receive what they were telling me. And my wife grew up in a Catholic church, you know, and basically, you know, we knew that Christ died. We all knew that. You learned that in Sunday school. But we knew that up here. When we transferred it down here and believed to him out of our heart and did Romans 10, 9 and 10, that's when we became a part of the church, part of the body of Christ. Okay, before that, we were lost, just like most of you. Okay, all of you. All right. Okay, let's flip the page. Number three. Okay. Salvation is also referred to in the New Testament as being born again or a new birth or new creation. They all, you know, all mean one and the same. John 3, 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, speaking to Nicodemus, a Jew, a ruling Jew here. He says, very, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to be born again or you are going to go south when you die to a very hot place called hell. All right. Once you're a believer, you die, you go north into heaven. All right. You don't want to go south. OK. All right. Uh, John or Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ or become a believer in Him, he is a new creature, new creation. Old things are passed away. You don't have no previous life. All the dumb stuff you did has been forgiven. Okay, you can start life over again. All right, they're all old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You now got a new life ahead of you, walking in Christ Jesus. That's pretty good. God now dwells in us. First Corinthians three sixteen. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Spirit of God comes in and takes up residence in your spirit. When you said those few simple words, Jesus, I want you as my Lord and Savior. At the end of our services, how many know Pastor Jerry has an altar call? For what? Ask people to receive Christ. Remember, you know, raise your hand. They raise their hands. And if that belief is coming from their heart, they enter into the body of Christ. They become believers. All right. A, the Holy Spirit makes you alive unto God and now resides in you. Entering a new kingdom. Colossians 1.13, very important scripture. This talks about a benefit that we have now since we've received Christ. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, that means authority there, and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You were walking into the kingdom of darkness. It was ruling you, guiding you, controlling you, manipulating you. And when somebody came along and shared words of Jesus with you and you received Jesus, you stepped out of the kingdom of darkness. He transferred you, translated you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. A, you are now freed from the kingdom of darkness and its control and placed into the kingdom of God. There is only one way to heaven, to the Father and eternity with him. Acts 4.12. I got to go quickly, so you write quickly. Amen. Got a lot of stuff to tell you. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, all right, not, not any Hindu gods. There's only one way. All right, John 14, 6, I already read that, quoted that. A, there's only one way to have salvation, and that is through believing in Jesus Christ. This is God's only plan. There is no other plan. Okay, this is God's A plan. There's no B plan. It's coming through Christ. That's the only way. Okay. Uh, B, the Christian faith is the only faith that God can have relationship with. Yes, true, true, true. All right. Uh, Galatians 1.9. Paul writing to the church here, he says, If we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. That word accursed there means anathema. It means to be eternally lost. Okay. There's only one way. A, all religions, doctrines, philosophies, organizations, etc., that do not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ are false 
and of the spirit of Antichrist. I don't care how many times they invite you over for dinner, come over and cut your grass when you go on vacation. All right? I don't care how nice people are to you, they are lost if they have not received Christ. Okay? You don't get to heaven by doing good works. All right? You don't get to heaven by doing good works. If that were true, why did Jesus need to come? Why did Jesus suffer that horrible death if there's another way? It doesn't make sense. Okay? It's through Christ and Him alone. B, this is why the church is still here, to finish preaching the gospel of Christ. It's the only reason we are in this room and on this earth once we become believers, okay, is to finish the work that Jesus did not finish. Jesus was one man, could be only be in one place at one time. The church now is many men and can be in many places. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's our job. Our job is to get as many people uh, saved, all right, saved from the judgment of God that's going to come on this earth, saved from hell. That's our only reason for being here. And sadly to say, many Christians don't ever tell anybody about this. Okay? For whatever reason, all right, they just don't. Don't do that. Okay. All right, that's the end of class number one. You have about five.